in the summer of 2002, my family and I moved from Athens, Georgia to Columbia, Missouri. And I want to set the scene and remind you a little bit of what the climate of the country was like at the time. Um, remember, we moved in summer 2002, so the previous September, planes had crashed in the World Trade Center buildings. Um, and Osama bin Laden allegedly had taken responsibility for the terrorist attacks, and Americans were hungry for war and revenge. American flags were flying all over the place. If you drove through any residential area, you'd see driveways lined with American flags all along the sidewalks, too. Uh, many cars had American flags, those noisy flags flapping on, their, on the doors. I think it was around this time also uh, that it became a thing to dress in stars and stripes and grand say America. Um, usually they were posing, they would do this posing in front of some menacing looking picture of a, of a bald eagle. Um, year round it looked like Memorial Day, 4th of July, and the Olympics all at once. Um, this particular brand of patriotism, though, it wasn't just for love of country and homeland. It was becoming synonymous with calling for war, and it was sounding more bloodthirsty than anything else. Um, the late Toby Keith had a song called Courtesy of the Red, White, and Blue, spent 25 weeks on the Billboard charts, and reached number one in August of that year. And I want to give you all just a little sample of the lyrics. Now this nation I love has fallen under attack. A mighty sucker punch came flying in from somewhere in the back. Soon as we could see clearly through our big black eye, man, we lit up your world like the 4th of July. Hey, Uncle Sam put your name at the top of his list and the Statue of Liberty started shaking her fist. And the eagle will fly, man, it's gonna be hell when you hear Mother Freedom start ringing her bell. And it feels like the whole wide world is raining down on you. Oh, brought to you courtesy of the red, white, and blue. Oh, this and justice will be served. The battle will rage. This dog will fight when you rattle his cage. And you'll be sorry you mess with the U.S. of A. Because we'll put a boot in your ass. It's the American way. So that beautiful piece of poetry was number one. <laughs> number one on the charts is very popular at karaoke bars. People somehow, well, the truth is we all know how this happened, but people somehow got distracted and forgot that Osama bin Laden had taken responsibility for the attacks, and their focus shifted to then-president of Iraq, Saddam Hussein, and his supposed weapons of mass destruction. With the war drums beating loudly in the following March, the U.S. invaded Iraq with the stated purpose to, quote, disarm Iraq of weapons of mass destruction, to end Saddam Hussein's support for terrorism, and get this, my favorite part, to free the Iraqi people. As an aside, some of you will remember, a lot of you here are too young to remember this, but some of you will uh, remember this hilarious quote slash lie, or do I repeat myself, from Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld. Um, speaking of those weapons of mass destruction, he said, oh, we know where they are. They're in the area around Tikrit and Baghdad and east, south, west, and north uh, somewhat. <laughs> That's a quote. Look it up. Anyway, uh, they didn't know, and the WMDs were never found, uh, allegedly because Saddam Hussein was just so darn good at hiding them. Anyway, it was in that setting and uh, when we'd moved to Columbia, Missouri, uh, sometime in, late in 2003, I was pleased to find a group in our new town called PeaceWorks. They weren't the most doctrinally sound group. They clearly were not daily readers of the Mises Wire, but they were very strongly anti-war. And they put out a bumper sticker and yard signs that had a blue background with a white dove on it, and it said, it had the words, peace is popular. I loved the idea, and I cheered them on in their anti-war protests. Mostly their protests were, uh, standing at a busy intersection downtown with signs that said, honk for peace. And you know I honked, so. Uh, but my reaction was, oh, peace is popular. Oh, I wish it was popular. But clearly right now, peace is not popular. But wouldn't it be great 
if the idea of peace appealed to more people, um, if the fever of war for war could be reversed and the national tide turned back towards keeping our men safely at home out of harm's way. Peace was not pop the popular sentiment or preference at the time, but it was right, morally and every other way. Fifteen years later, in 2017, with the loosely defined, defined global war on terror still going on, with air drone strikes in at least seven different countries, uh, the atmosphere had changed. People had grown weary of war. Ron Paul gave a speech titled, Peace is Popular, and he said, 90% of the people you'll meet are for peace, especially young people said the problem is that people who suffer from wars aren't the ones who get us involved in the wars. This wasn't a new message for Dr. Paul, and wasn't it great to see him today? That was a great surprise. But uh, he's, this wasn't a new message for Dr. Paul. He had been spreading the message for peace um, consistently since he was first running for Congress in the 1970s. It wasn't easy. He was speaking out against an overwhelming tide of nationalism and war frenzy. But as we've all recognized, Dr. Paul has a distinctive courage about him, coming from knowing what, that he was on the side of what's right and caring not one bit about what was popular. So we could take some notes from Dr. Paul and others like Mises, Rothbard, and Lou Rockwell, who showed great fortitude in the face of not just criticism, but even ostracism, the courage to speak up and risk being called an extremist. Um, I remember almost 30 years ago after the Oklahoma City bombing when people were blaming, quote, right-wing extremism. My husband asked, hey, why is extreme getting so much hate? What's wrong with being extremely nice or extremely handsome? And he would know. He would know. <laughs> so, uh, but today especially in the midst of cancel culture when it seems like the stakes get higher all the time, it really takes courage to speak up, courage to speak up against profligate government spending and for sound money, against endless war and for peace in Ukraine, Gaza and elsewhere, against labor regulations, environmental regulations, antitrust regulations, every other type of regulations, and for freely functioning markets with producers employing their capital as they see fit to best serve their customers, earning rewards and suffering losses for their decisions. However, we should pause at least briefly before we plunge headlong into cultivating this virtue of courage. Don't deceive yourself into thinking that it'll be easy or that being courageous will win you friends. Christ said we must count the cost before we set out any course of action. In Luke 14, 28 and 29, he said, For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation and he's not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him. So it's prudent to, dis to consider what it might cost in doing not what's popular, but what is right. And today, we're celebrating the outstanding achievement of three students who will be receiving their master's degree from the Mises Graduate School. You graduates have worked hard to make your own contributions to the great edifice of Austrian economics, building on the foundations laid by Minger and Mises and Rothbard and many others. Now we hope and expect that the possession of this master's degree will provide not only intellectual satisfaction, um, but also professional advancement. Holding a graduate degree in economics is a rare accolade um, something that distinguishes you from the vast majority of those who express an opinion on economic affairs. Um, Murray Rothbard put it, it's no crime to be ignorant of economics, which is after all a specialized discipline and one that most people consider to be a dismal science. But it's totally irresponsible to have a loud and vociferous opinion on economic subjects while remaining in the state of ignorance. But you are now officially recognized as authorities in Austrian economics. So congratulations. However, and I hope I'm not the first one to tell you this, the Austrian school is not the dominant perspective uh, on economic matters within the wider world. Far from it. Um, an advanced degree in Austrian economics is unlikely to open the door to a seat on the Federal Reserve Board. <laughs> You're not going to get a cushy position with Goldman Sachs or what 
I call the fourth branch of the federal government, <laughs> or a professorship at Harvard. Those probably aren't the offers that are coming to you this afternoon. Um, some critics will reject our theories and analysis. Um, if you post the conclusions from your thesis on some social media platforms, they might be flagged as misinformation or as Dr. Malone called it last night, malinformation. Um, <clears throat> information is deemed to be true and correct, but it's information that will make people distrust the government. So in other words, while we're here at Mises Institute, while we here at Mises Institute regard being an Austrian economist as one of the highest callings, we recognize that the outside world may not see it that way. As we'll discuss, doing uh, the right thing often incurs a significant cost. And we want to think of the cost to Mises and Rothbard and, and Lou Rockwell, brilliant men who didn't forsake first principles for the sake of their career. They gave up approval and accolades in the academy and instead pursued educating generations after them in the ideas of liberty. I'd like to talk just a little bit about some of the costs to Murray Rothbard. And a lot of you here already know um, these stories. In fact, I've heard some of you tell these, but in this context, I think these stories are worth repeating today. Um, first of all, there will never be, there never has been or never will be again another one like Murray Rothbard. Um, physically, if you didn't meet him, he was a little man, but he had big heart and even bigger brains. Uh, Hans Hoppe called him the greatest social theorist of the 20th century, maybe of all time. Um, Murray was a notorious night owl and could stay up later than any young scholars who were having the distinct pleasure of long, fun chats on any topic into the wee hours. Um, Rothbard never used a computer but did all his writing. By the way, writing that's probably more than you can read and digest in your lifetime. Uh, he did it all on a typewriter until his death in 1995. Um, I myself tend to be uh, a pretty late adopter of new technology. I remember we were the first ones in all of all town to get a wireless phone. We held out. We had the, the corded phone for years. But anyway, uh, but even I had a PC that was pretty good for the time in 1992. Um, but despite... Uh, uh, Rothbard's passing before the internet age, Rothbard found a way to somehow know something about everything. It was mind-boggling. Uh, you want to know the intricacies, the Rwandan conflict between the Hutus and the Tutsis? Who were the good guys? What was at stake? Murray knew all of that. Um, the ins and outs of college basketball. He was a big fan of Jerry Tarkanian, the coach at UNLV, and he knew the strategy, the best and worst coaches and players. He knew all of that. Uh, also, daytime soap operas, all my children. You want to know, was Liza going to be able to win Greg back after he left her for Jenny? Murray could spill the tea on all that, too. <laughs> and that's in addition to knowing both the history and the current state of a wide range of academic subjects. So we're not limited just to the social sciences. Uh, Lou Rockwell tells a story of being in a bookstore in Palo Alto with Rothbard and David Gordon. And between the two of them, they had either read or were very familiar with almost every single book that any one of them could pick up in the whole bookstore. But as for challenges uh, that Murray faced, when he was finishing up his graduate work in Columbia, um, Rothbard passed his oral exams and began his work on his dissertation in 1948. Then it was held up primarily for personal reasons by the eventual chairman of the Federal Reserve, Arthur Burns. Uh, Burns was chairman of the department, and he uh, disagreed with Rothbard's advisor. Um, so he kept, he kept Rothbard from progressing to graduation. Um, and we'll talk about some of the other many obstacles that Rothbard faced. This is the only story that I have ever heard about Rothbard being discouraged. Um, but his lovely wife, Joey, told the story of coming home and finding him distraught, worried that he would never get to finish. But five years later, five years, um, in 1953, Arthur Burns left, for, left Columbia for D.C., um, for a stint at the Council of Economic Advisors to Eisenhower. Again, we can all 
Uh, but once Burns left, the obstacle was removed, and then he was allowed to proceed with his dissertation. His degree was granted in 1956. Um, Rothbart's often criticized as being intransigent. This is a word I've come to despise because I think the negative connotation is unfair. From the root word transigir, which means to compromise, we get intransigence, suggesting an unwillingness to compromise or come to an agreement, like that's a bad thing. I never hear anybody describe a person as obstinate or intransigent and mean it as a positive. But what if instead, what if intransigence is a noble, admirable quality Rothbard described his arrival at a libertarian position as happening not, quote, from some sort of analysis of externalities or transactions costs or anything of that sort. It was a question of justice versus criminality, end quote. When those are the options, isn't the more virtuous person the one who refuses to compromise? Rothbard found the laissez-faire limited state position inconsistent. He knew he had to become an anarchist or a statist. This came after a debate with some of his classmates in graduate school. Rothbard said that one of them asked if we, this is Rothbard telling the story, one of them asked if we can agree on a social contract for the necessity of a police force, then why can't society also agree to have the government build steel mills and price controls or whatever? So after graduating from Columbia, Rothbard was, was supported by the Volcker Fund. <clears throat> And he was able to do research and write freelance on a freelance basis from home. And during that time, among other works he produced, Man, Economy, and State, and um, the America's Great Depression. Uh, when the Volcker Fund closed, he sought employment in some of New York's academic institutions, was finally hired on part-time in 1966 at Brooklyn Polytechnic Institute, an engineering and technical school. Hans Hoppe told the story of coming to the U.S. in the 1980s, brought over here by uh, Rothbard with the help of the late, great Bert Blummert. Hans also, Hans, of course, already knew that Rothbard was a radical outsider, but he underestimated how much sacrifice that would entail in leftist academia, financially and otherwise. He knew that Brooklyn Polytechnic wasn't a prestigious university by any means, but he still had expectations that Rothbard, of Rothbard enjoying a comfortable, well-paying position there. Coming from Germany, Hoppe's idea of the U.S., he said, was that here in the U.S., we're all for freedom and capitalism, and of course, Murray Rothbard is the greatest proponent of liberty, so surely he would be held in high esteem, so to speak whether in academia <laughs> or in the business world. Instead, at Brooklyn Polytechnic, Rothbard shared a small, windowless office with a history professor, and his salary was barely enough to get by. Finally, at the age of 60, Rothbard's circumstances improved significantly when he moved to UNLV in 1986. Hoppe joined him there and said that Rothbard had an endowed chair but was not given the added resources a position like that would usually afford. But Hoppe added that Murray never complained or displayed any bitterness about it at all. He just plugged along with great optimism and joy. Despite Rothbard's towering achievement as an intellectual champion of the free market, of free market capitalism, Rothbard never won any prestigious mainstream prizes, awards, or honors no high position in the American Economic Association, no Nobel Prize. But Rothbard was unfazed by the lack of recognition because he expected none. <clears throat> Rothbard understood that the strongest opposition of Austrian economics and libertarianism would come not from traditional socialists, but instead from the minimal state beltway libertarians. Murray had demonstrated with clear logic the inconsistency of their doctrines Murray argued, once you accept the very idea of a state and that the state is ultimate, the ultimate authority in settling disputes over territory, including the disputes that involve the state, then private property ceases to exist. Even if property is legally recognized as private, it effectively becomes collective. Any state at all means socialism, that is, the collective ownership of the means of production, 
Thus, Murray demonstrated that any state contradicts the concept of private property and private enterprise. Therefore, anyone who truly supports private property must reject the existence of any state. In other words, to be a true advocate for private property, one must become an anarchist. Hoppe goes on to say that yes, Murray was unwilling to compromise, but Hoppe added that in theory and in thinking, compromise is impermissible. In everyday life, of course, compromise is everywhere, but in theory, you must never be open to compromise. There's no compromise between incompatible propositions. If one proposition is true, another proposition is false, there can be no meeting in the middle. UNLV, Rothbard, and Hoppe were thwarted in their efforts to create the place to come to study Austrian economics. Instead, the majority of the department voted to hire Marxists and other non-Austrians, and they fought mightily to limit the influence of Rothbard, who, by the way, was the most recognized faculty member of the entire university. Um, this was disappointing for sure, but it didn't dampen Rothbard's in infectious enthusiasm. Uh, Rothbard became even more radically anarchist and less tolerant of watered-down messaging in the last years of his life. Of course, on a personal basis, he was good-natured and charming and lovable and a real sweetheart. I remember my own first in-person experience of Murray in 1992. Uh, it was a total hoot, and he was so sweet. I was, of course, extremely excited to meet him, understatement. Um, I talked so fast and in a blur, he didn't catch my name. He thought my name was Sadie. Um, in the, this, it was my fault, though. In the following years until his death, whenever I asked him any research question, he was patient, never letting on how bad my questions were. Um, he was very encouraging, very generous with his time, providing pages-long lists of references uh, for me to check out. No doubt, he was a soft-hearted prince of a man. But in writing and in speeches, his resolve never faltered. He remained uncompromising as he watched the leftward drift of Beltway libertarians. As they made many pleas for all kinds of rights, Murray dismantled each one of them as being inconsistent with property rights, civil rights, rights to health, rights to be free of unpleasant speech. He showed that the right of, the right of prop, private property was the only right that can be defended as universal. Murray explained that a call for a right beyond that of private property is rooted in egalitarianism, which we know he called a revolt against nature, owing to the undeniable fact that people are different. After enduring many hardships and difficulties in mainstream academia, Rothbard was overjoyed to finally find his intellectual home here at the Mises Institute. Here, he's been given the respect and honor he and his great body of work deserves, Lou Rockwell knew that having Murray involved in the Institute was crucial to its success, and he asked Murray to be the Vice President of Academic Affairs. If you look downstairs, when you come in the front door, um, on the inside, just to the right of the front door, is a framed letter from Murray to Lou accepting the position. I teared up when I read it just the other day. Um, <clears throat> Rothbard became known affectionately as the Dean of the Austrian School of Economics. Through the flourishing of the Mises Institute and the reach of Mises.org, and thanks to many generous donors, Rothbard's influence has grown far beyond anything he could have imagined. Rothbard was the lead instructor at Mises University until his passing in 1995. He loved spending the week with students and his faculty colleagues. At the same time, he also dreamed of offering graduate education in Austrian economics a dream that was realized with the establishment of the week-long Rothbard Graduate Seminar in 1999, and then more recently, the Mises Graduate School. So Murray Rothbard would have been so pleased and proud to see your accomplishments today. So know that the diploma you'll soon hold in your hand is not only recognition and verification of your success in your academic studies, it also represents a realization of Rothbard's long-term vision. So we have reason to be optimistic about the future. Rothbard always worked with great enthusiasm and joy despite the many obstacles he faced. The reason why his spirits never dampened is because he had optimism, <clears throat> which he said may be very long range. 
He didn't merely believe the possibility of eventual victory, but implied that given a fairly safe set of assumptions, the triumph of liberty was practically inevitable. So there will never be another Rothbard. We can learn from his example and try to imitate him. So here's to a brighter future and to having the admirable quality of intransigence. Congratulations. Congratulations.